Yes, yes. What's going on, guys? My name is Eddie Transcendent, and you're now tuned in, either watching or listening to Transcendent Outlook, a podcast I put together to highlight either people, organizations, or businesses that I think are, are, are transcending in what they're doing, meaning they're going above and beyond. Uh, the gentleman I have with me today is someone who, again, I think is going above and beyond. And when I say above and beyond, I kind of just mean somebody who's doing more than just, just, just original, like the, the usual stuff, right? They're going above and beyond in their work, in their life. Um, and, and giving more back to the community, right? And so, um, again, today, today's guest is somebody who, who I've known for a while now, who has been doing that for a while now. And I think that, um, that I wanted to get to know him a little better. And I figured the best way to do it was by recording it. That, that way you guys can watch it and get to know him a little better as well. Um, so without further ado, Calvin, what's going on, brother? So fantastic, man. Everything good? Thank you for having me yes. here on Transcendent Outlook. Yes. Uh, so happy to be here. Again, my name is Calvin Ayala for anyone uh, who's li- listening to the audience and not sure uh, who I am, but I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut, yes. and uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Man. No, no, so super excited. So so they're going to be available not only uh, through video on YouTube, but it'll also be audio on Spotify, Apple, all that stuff. So some people may not be able to see you, so it's good for to kind of like, let them Fantastic. know. Fantastic. For the people in the car, yeah. Plug in. It, yeah, somebody exactly. on the treadmill, whatever it is, you know, they can, they can know who you are. Um, but like I just said, I've been knowing you for a long time, but I don't really know, like, I don't know you know you, right? So, and we see the things that you do here and there, we hear about it. Um, but I don't really exactly know who you are. I know that you have some connections with different folks in, 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 in the community, right, um, um, for a long time. Um, and so I'm really interested in just knowing who you are and, and how did you come about? How, how, how are you who you are today, right? So let's start there. Let's start, like, where are you from? Wow, I was born. In the- <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so uh, you know, great question. I mean, I think, uh, I think all of us in our, in our personal and professional journeys, like, yeah. I think we all kind of reach – a, a, a space and I think even internally we ask ourselves wow man how to get here yeah and I, I tell people all the time when um you know just in professional coaching or development or whether I'm dealing with business owners or just people who are looking to get something done their career journey I tell people all the time you know sit down for like an hour and just write your bio down yeah and as you write your bio and you're just writing down stuff about you when you're done the first question you ask yourself is who the hell is that? <laughs> you know, because yeah, I think yeah. we've all done impressive stuff, but we yeah. undermine our own values sometimes. Yeah. You know, we don't realize how impactful we've been or what we've done until you put it down on writing and you you, you look at it and you're like, oh my yeah. God. And then you're super impressed because yeah. you think you're writing about somebody else, but it's you. Yeah. You know, so I think that's, that, that's part of it. But a li- little bit about me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in Bridgeport, okay. uh, Connecticut, uh, for people listening out, out of state. And so... Uh, growing up to Brit- in Bridgeport for me was fantastic just because we didn't know any better. Yeah. You know, you, you have, you're exposed to so much in a compressed window. Yeah. So to say, so I grew up on the east side of Bridgeport, uh, right around the block of Father Painting Village. Okay. For those who don't know, that's the second largest housing project ever built in the United States. So that comes with a unique feel and perspective. Yeah. Of what community looks like and stuff like that. So, you know, we're definitely exposed to a lot of different elements, but, um, you know, moving on, uh, you know, I'm a Bridgeporter through and through, so the the the, the blood flows through my veins. So, yeah. you know, I'm always carry a chip on my shoulder when people talk bad about the city that uh, that produced people like such as myself and countless of other people that have been uh, uber successful that have come out of um, Bridgeport, yeah. so to say. But uh, I, I did leave Bridgeport to go to college. I went to University of Hartford. Okay. Uh, pursued an engineering degree. Oh, you didn't go that far, though. Yeah, no. I, so it's funny because I, I always was like, man, I don't want I want to go far enough that I have to leave home. Yeah. But not so far that I couldn't come back, like, you know, if I got homesick or uh, or needed help or or let's face it, I was broke. So yeah. I'm like, hey, mom, dad, <laughs> I need to. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to eat. <laughs> and, and as you can see, it doesn't look like I skip a lot of meals. So I, even back then, you're, you're mindful about those things. But I didn't go too far. So um, I pursued engineering. I got a, a degree in electrical engineering with a, with a minor in computer science. And in that work, I also interned at Sikorsky Aircraft. Okay. Um, through a phenomenal, shameless plug, phenomenal organization called Inroads. Okay. Uh, Inc. So, uh, if anyone has a uh, family member or someone that's in college and looking for co- um, paid internships, check out inroads.org. Sh- uh, shameless plug. But that that was a career development organization. Okay. So okay. It was really dope because I got in right out of high school. So not only did I have a paid internship at Scorsese Aircraft, 
they provided professional development and experiences yeah. that I would have never got growing got up in, the, in, in, in Bridgeport. So that kind of like, that's like the foundation yeah. of, of who I am because that kind of shaped to where we're going. Well, uh, let's, let's back up just a little bit. What, what, what leads a young man growing up in the east side of Bridgeport to go to college for engineering? Like what, what, what happened between kind of the kid to college that made you say, that's what I want to do? Yeah, good question. I mean, I was always fascinated by architecture, you know, buildings. Yeah. Architecture always fascinated me. So I always said I was going to be, you know, going to art, you know, become an architect. Yeah. You know, like, you know, when you're, you're in sixth grade, everybody want to be architect. Yeah. And, you know, all I knew was they made buildings. Yeah. And I thought buildings or the historical buildings are, are really cool to me. Uh, just to see like the, all this amazing detail. Um, but then I, I got into computers and technology when I was in high school. So fascinated as computers becoming a big thing. Yeah. And so, you know, I, it was just kind of came together. And then I attended a program at University of Bridgeport that was all around engineering. So I got more exposure to types of careers you can get into in engineering, how yeah. diverse it is. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think people misunderstand the field of engineering. You know, because you have people who invent stuff. Yeah. Engineers tend to take things that already exist and make them better. Got it. For everybody, Got right? It. So yeah. um, I, I was really into computers and electrical engineering kind of just fit into that whole thing. And and that's just where it ended up. Now, now, what, what year are we talking here when you're getting into computers, right? Because, and I say that because my lead up, my question after that would be, how was it getting into computers in a time where maybe a lot of people weren't really into computers? Yeah, so so we're talking about 1990 okay. around there. So right around super early. Yeah, super super early. So I mean, back then you had what we called Windows 3.1. Yeah, and then the original Macintosh in the mid 80s. So were you were you were you, were you like a nerd? Like, like yeah, a, like yeah, a quote, unquote yeah, nerd? I mean, I always did well in school. And yeah, I was always around extracurricular activities that exposed you to different things. Yeah. I remember in grammar school we had a little computer lab and they had. Commodore 64s. I'm aging myself. Yeah. But uh, for those you know who grew up around the game of basketball and if, in those early days of computers, yeah. there was a game. It's legendary. Magic Johnson versus Larry Bird. Yeah. On one on one, and it's just like a like like a block stick figure guy shooting jump shots, and, and, and you use a paddle from yeah. like the old Atari. So, but it was fascinating to me that. You know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm watching a TV screen, and this thing, yeah. it's imaging. Yeah. And I, so I'm just fascinated and how fast paced technology from from me playing a Magic vs. Bird video game yeah. to 1990 and what we were now doing with a mouse and clicking on yeah. icons and opening up, you know, a spreadsheet or, or just typing. Wait, 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 but were you were you kind of like on, your, on an island with these feelings of how fascinating you thought it was? Right? Yeah. Because, I say that because today it's almost normal, right? It, but it, back then, to do that, you had to be a special absolutely. person. Absolutely, there was no YouTube to go to to go learn this stuff. That too, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was yeah. a tinker, man. You know, you're, you're finding old electrical components. You're pulling it apart. Yeah. You're trying to see what's in it, what makes it go. Yeah, yeah. I've broken enough radios. <laughs> you know, I had my my Sony Walkman. For those of you, you know, the Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, the Walkman that he was carrying yeah. all the time. I had one of those. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got your headphones. You. So yeah, I'm, I guess I was a nerd. I was yeah, always. Yeah. Always intrigued with how things work and how we got there. Yeah, you know. So I'm always yeah. trying to connect. And, and, and I don't, I don't, and, I don't. And, and those lessons play today. Yeah, and I don't, I don't say that like in a disrespectful way. I say it almost like I feel like we called you a nerd then, but today we're all nerds because th th this is what we do. Yeah. No. Listen. Everyone has a computer in their pocket. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I take that from my my my, uh, my my business partner. She always says everyone has a computer in their pocket. Yes. Call a phone. Yeah. And we literally do probably 90% of the functions that we do in front of a computer, we're doing yeah. on our phone as well. Yeah. Um, but now technology has evolved so much over the last 30 years. When I first got introduced to computers, I was just fascinated by what it can do on the screen, seeing change of colors, clicking on an icon, see the program come up, and kind of productivity, right? Yeah. Back then it was about productivity software, right? I can, I no longer need this clunky typewriter. I can type on a yeah. keyboard and, and get stuff done and print it. And just seeing something you just typed that, up come yeah, to yeah, life, yeah, yeah. you know, So, and then it's evolved from there. Now, once I got to college, and you know, America Online comes out, <laughs> CompuServe. Yeah. We're now connecting on the internet and talking to people all around the world. In like 1992, so we went from 1990 yeah. to 92, 93. I'm in college, and and we're literally talking to people around the world um, because of this thing called the internet. Yeah, and we're like, holy cow. 
So it's like a whole nother world. Yeah. So I knew back then this thing's going to be big. Uh, and my whole thing was how do I get involved? You know, how do I learn more? Yeah. How do I learn more? Yeah. Uh, so that led me to just playing around with computers. Got it. And, Got it. Um, tinkering, building my own computer. Okay. Uh, to the point where by the time end of my college years, as I'm still starting to be an engineer, I started a, my first small business I started was doing computer repair. Okay. On campus. Got it. Everyone was messing up their laptop yeah. or whatever, and I was the guy. Calvin's here, <laughs> man. <laughs> and, Got it. And, and, and so that that's how I was able to um, kind of uh, feed myself on my stay on my own two feet. Got it. And not be as re, as reliant on my parents for for, for finances. Yeah, yeah. During during the tail end of the college years, you know. But but that all started from the, you know just having that curiosity. Yeah. Uh, in the early years and and being exposed and. Let me mind, be mindful too. I'm being exposed to computers yeah. with maybe the worst equipment at the time. It wasn't like I was at a great school. So, so, yeah. so it matters, right? Even any exposure matters to young people. Yeah. You know, because we don't know that there's something better out there. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is what I got. This yeah. is cool. This is all I got. Yeah. yeah. I got it. So after you get done in Hartford, I mean, so yeah, in Hartford. Yeah. You come back to Bridgeport. Yeah. So I end up, I ended up staying in Hartford for for a few years, and then I I, I did eventually come back this way. But I, I ended up working as an avionics engineer. Okay. At Sikorsky Aircraft, so they gave me an internship, and that I turned into a job. That it, it turned into a job opportunity. So okay. think about this: I literally had a job offer, a full time job offer at the end of my junior year of college. Okay. All I had to do was finish my and complete my degree. So you want to talk about while my peers were going through ridiculous, stressful times, looking for a job or trying to figure out what's next. Yeah, I literally had a job offer in waiting, and my only pressure was was that even what I wanted to do. Yeah, you know. But I did take the offer, and I did work as an avionics engineer for a few years. Uh, but then I realized that wasn't my passion, man. Yeah. So that that's kind of the evolution of what happened. So by 1999, 2000, my computer business that I started, yeah. I now had a full-fledged retail store okay. here on the east side of Bridgeport on East Main Street. Okay. And, um, and that was what? That was What was that called? Uh, that was called PC Flex Computers. Okay. Right? And I had that literally for about eight years. Yeah. And uh, it was right on East Main Street going towards the old motor, Department of Motor Vehicles. Yeah, on East, on Main, East Main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was literally about a block away. Okay. I, I think and, I remember. Yeah. yeah so, that, so that was kind of like how I started to get a passion for um, business and understanding business and the challenges a small business goes through, hired my first employee. Yeah. Uh, you kind of learn a lot of things about what's going on. And my whole thing was, I'm going to be, I'm going to cure the digital divide yeah. uh, in my neighborhood, you know, and, and for those who don't know, that was always the term that was used where, Hey, people in lower income communities don't have access to computers, internet, and all those other technological advances that, let's say, suburban counterparts have. So we were kind of always considered we're being left behind yeah. because we don't have access to, these, to, to the technology. Yeah. So in, in my computer store, literally, we would offer free internet to people in the community uh, okay. to just come in and use the internet to send a resume somewhere or anything like that. So, okay. so, so in it, I've always found that I've always been a giver and giving back to the community. But yeah. It evolved to that, you know. I, I I always felt well, maybe I should be filling a bigger role, a bigger need. Yeah, you know, and so just kind of grew. So there. so you said about ten years with the business. Yeah. So so the 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 retail part of the business I kept around seven years. Okay. Right, seven years in a brick and mortar store. Um, around two thousand and three, two thousand four, I started to get out of retail and I went strictly consulting. Okay, and uh, and then that company evolved into what we call a point of sale company, where I was doing hospitality consulting for major restaurants and retail outlets, and we were the people that would come and install all the IT. Okay, so all of the computer systems, your touchscreen systems, the credit card systems, all of the systems used in retail and hospitality to keep track of inventory, yeah. sales, manage staff, employees. So that brought me into a diff understanding a different aspect. Of, of of business consulting 
yeah. or, or what business a business needs in order to thrive. So, so, so we're, we're talking 030405. You're yeah, there. absolutely. So, so, I, so you're, you're not even dealing with, you're not working with the community yet. You're still kind of. Yes. Like, yeah. So, I mean, I've always been involved in a community okay. as, as an activist or just giver or coaching or whether basketball, baseball. So I've always been involved in the community, but yeah. I never, I, I would keep my community involvement separate from yeah. business pursuits. Yeah. Per se, but the consulting aspect of the business really started in 1999. Okay. When I saw the consulting aspect growing um, exponentially compared to what the brick and mortar store was doing, I decided to shut the computer store down yeah. and strictly go the consulting route. Okay. But the consulting business literally went from 99 all the way to 2015. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. you recently. Oh, no. I had, I had a good 15 year run yeah. in that company. I eventually. Uh, Sold the company, and um, but I took a lot of relationships okay. uh, with that company, with me, and a lot of experiences that I learned yeah. that I carry today into how I do business and what and what I do. And 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 so 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 2015, you sold it, or you kind of just like yeah. So I sold off a, a portion of a portfolio. Okay. I did retain a couple of clients. I, there were a lot of clients that were you know when you when you're working with someone for 10, 15 years, they want to become family, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they, they were around when my daughters were born. Yeah. For example, you know, so now we're talking about family and and, and, and other things. So they, there were a series of clients that I kind of retained. Yeah. Uh, that I didn't give up in a portfolio and, and continued to kind of provide them yeah. technical support on their computer systems and, and stuff like that. But my interest were always changing towards uh, real estate yeah. and, and, and again, that original passion for architecture and buildings and how all these things interconnect. Yeah. So small businesses interconnect with real estate, right? Yeah. You want to open up a, a small business, what do you need? You need a place to operate out of. Yeah. So now we're tapping into the real estate market. And when we're talking about how do we build a business that's going to last for years and years, or when we say it's sustainable, yeah. right? It is about the community. You're providing the products and goods and services too. So over maybe 20 years of being an entrepreneur, what I was really doing was community development in a way that no one really imagined or rethought community development. So yeah. I've actually used those lessons strategically to look at how, how cities move, yeah. you know, how, how things work around cities, whether you, you have the political end, you have the, 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 the business end of things, the local economy. Yeah. And then, of course, you have us as entrepreneurs trying to wave, wiggle through that to, yeah. to make money, right? We started building, we want to make money, right? Yeah. It's a passion. You want to turn your passion into profit, as they say. But in that, there's a lot of lessons learned, right? Yeah. You've got all the stumbling blocks, obstacles, growth, market change. So um, I've been able to take all that knowledge yeah. to now help many other business owners, many other people that look to come into our communities and kind of navigate the waters. When 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 did the did the did the word um entrepreneur start coming out of your mouth as, as far as like you describing yourself as that, right? When when did when did it become cool? You know what? I never really used the word entrepreneur to describe myself to maybe 2010. Okay. You know, I would say, you know, I have a small business. You yeah. Know, I have a business. Yeah. You know, you don't like entrepreneur is such a foreign word because in 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 my household, these aren't terms that we're using around our, our dinner table. Yeah. yeah. Right. We 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 grew up in we, these aren't conversations we have. You know, we are taught to, you know, um go to school, get good grades, get a good job. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of the extent of the conversation. You know, um everyone always wants what's best for you and you know, your parents always want to give you, you know, we as parents we always want to give our kids, yeah. what we didn't have when we grew up. Yeah. Um, but the truth is, those conversations were entrepreneurs is a long word. I still can't spell it. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, it, it wasn't until you get a real understanding that you know what? Wow, professionally, I am an entrepreneur. Yeah. So now we got to start getting comfortable with the language of the fields that we practice in. Yeah. And and, and I think that's kind of, that's just evolution, right? The, yeah. the same way as individuals, we all mature. Um, there's a maturity level you get in business, there's a maturity level you get in your professional development, there's a maturity level of different stages of one's life yeah. in our in our journey to wherever we're we're at. So when when I mean it, saying what you just said about the dinner table and the things that we talk about, as you're doing the things that you're doing, how's your family kind of like are they kind of like riding with you? Oh yeah, yeah. They, super supportive. Okay. Super, super supportive. You know, my my 
my, my, my parents were always super supportive. My dad had a, this ridiculous drive and work ethic. Um, you know, he retired from General Electric as a supervisor uh, at General Electric. But, um, you know, I, I, I got a real understanding of, of, you know, the hard work and that work ethic and that drive. Yeah. But they were always super supportive. Of course, they always want, you know, they thought I was crazy. Hey, you, you left a great <laughs> job. Yeah. You're an engineer. So in our communities, we're taught, listen, engineer, lawyer, doctor. doctor. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they, no one knows what those paths mean, um, you know, when we have these conversations. But they just know doctors make good money. Exactly. Lawyers make good exactly. money. Engineer. So the thought of me leaving a major corporation as an avionics engineer was kind of crazy. Because they're like, what are you doing? You're nuts. Yeah. Like you had it made, but if you're not happy, you're not happy. Yeah, and and and, that, and that's what I was getting to. So 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 money doesn't equal happiness necessarily. No, absolutely no. My, now money is important. So don't. Of course, no, no, no. Of course, you know, my, yeah. my, money is important. I, I I would joke. Money is the reason you woke up this morning. Yeah. Because at some point, we <laughs> say before, yeah. you got to go chase the bag. Yeah. As, as as we say, but you want to do something that's reflective of your purpose and as you change and modify. And I think all of us, um, as individuals, probably every five, every every three to five years, we're kind of reevaluating um, where we are. We re reevaluate our circle of friends, uh, where we work at, where, yeah. where people call us. So we have a midlife crisis. Yeah. You know, so, oh, what what really is it? It's trying to align your goals, your personal drive, and how you feel about yourself. Yeah. And where you want to be. You know, I think we're consistently e evaluating ourselves. Yeah. And who's harder on ourselves than us? Yeah. You know, so, yeah, we're getting critiqued by people, whether it's people in the community or, you know, hey, now today with technology, someone leaves a bad Yelp review on your business. It's over. We, it's over, man. We take offense. <laughs> we're like, oh, yeah. my God. You know, but then, too, I tell people all the time, and I've been around the restaurant consulting industry a long time. I tell everyone. Go take a look at your favorite restaurant and go look at their reviews. I promise you, you're going to find bad reviews. Yeah, of course. So the truth is, we can't satisfy anyone. Yeah. But you got to be happy with self, right? Yeah. And if you're not your best self, you can't be a resource to other people. Yeah. Right? So you got to be confident enough in what you bring to the table so that you can be a resource to others. And I think that's part of, like, um, part of my journey was that I was able to put those pieces together early yeah. where I was able to be um, impactful in the journeys of a lot of other people along the way as I was doing what I, what, yeah. you know, my career trajectory and, and just moving on what I was doing. So what, what, what would you say is your purpose? My purpose is simply to impact as many people as possible along the journey. Okay. Um, you know, so I, there's nothing profound. Yeah. And and how I see my 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 journey or, or whatever. What I simply know is if I look at Greater Bridgeport and I look at a lot of what's happened here and let's say our local economy in the last 10, 15 years, I can honestly say that my DNA is in a lot of areas. Got it. And it's because I've I've created relationships, worked with people, whether it was through their business or got referred to someone or was even able to match a resource with this person yeah. to this person yeah. that helped them perform. Something as simple off. as that, yeah, yeah. Something as simple as that. What yeah. I know is my DNA is everywhere, yeah. and so if that's my legacy, I'll take it. No, I, I get it, and, and I agree because I believe that everybody's purpose is the same, and it's to give back. And so you're saying that your purpose is to give back. It's just how do we do it, right? And yeah. so you found different ways to do it. Yeah, correct. So, no, that, that, makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. Now, now... Um, Let's talk about you today and what it is that you're doing today, right? Because for me, seeing you, I feel like I've seen you in different roles, different times, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I don't know. Like, like if, I, if I had to write down right now, hey, I just interview Calvin, I, I don't know what would be the, the, the definition of like the actual like title of who you are, right? Yeah. So what, what, what are we doing these days? Yeah, so good question. So I, I'll bring it back to something I mentioned earlier, right? When you write that bio yeah. and you write all these things uh, down and you realize, oh, wow, I did that. Like, that's me. So similarly, I'm involved in a lot of uh, projects or just a lot of diverse areas that um, I think people are outside say, oh, my God, he's all over the place. Yeah. So that could be either a good thing or a bad thing. Right. Because they always say what the master of master, the master of, 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 of uh, what is it? Master yeah. of, 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 of a lot and uh, no, yeah, whatever. master but, of nothing. Yeah, whatever. We, it is. We, yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we know, know what we're talking, talking about. about. <laughs> so best believe that one thing um, 
I've always been good at is weaving things together. Yeah. So although it may seem like I have my hands involved in a lot of things or I'm, my hands in a lot of cookie jars, so to say, they all interrelate. Yeah. You know, so today uh, I consider myself an economic development advisor. Okay. Um, I do a lot of work around improving uh, the economic outlook in around, you know, whether whether it's through consulting work, whether it's consulting in other cities, whether it's here locally in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Yeah. Um, I charge people for my knowledge and expertise on economic development matters. Okay. Okay. Uh, so today, we, with a partner, we've launched a consulting company called Led by Us yeah. and Associates, which allowed me to partner with other like-minded consultants and bring in other knowledgeable people and subject matter experts into the world of economic development consultants so that we can pursue larger projects or make a deeper impact. Individually, I was already doing a lot of business development. Uh, I've coached up over 150 small business owners, um, helped bring their, their, their ideas to life um, through personal and direct coaching, strategic work with their um, information technology and um, giving them a framework to operate out of. So individually, I had a consulting company that was born through the the uh, consulting company I had with the IT. Yeah. And from there, I just, I've continued to always stay consulting uh, individually, but that brought me more into real estate development. Okay. Because working with landlords and owners of properties, right, they want good tenants. I was the, I was their secret sauce. Yeah. Right. Because they can erect a new building or, or, or take over and buy this property, but how were they going to get tenants that were going to fit what they were looking for? And and work in that area. So I'm the guy doing the market analysis, the feasibility study. I'm the guy with, who's the plug to these small businesses because I'm already coaching them up. Yeah. And now I'm pairing them up with this particular piece of real estate. Okay. So I've been doing real estate development in a different way than, let's say, a broker, a real estate broker would do. Okay. Because I have more vested uh, skin in the game. I'm literally working with this business to make sure that their books look good three years from now. I'm just not getting them into a lease and saying, God bless you. Good luck. Yeah. Taking a picture and cutting a ribbon. Yeah. You know, that's not what I do. Um, so in that role that I've carved out for myself, I've established a, a really um, large network of investors, real estate developers, and other people who have a trust and confidence in my ability to put deals together and bring people together, resources, and other things. Okay. So with that, you know, I'm the consulting company. And from there, one thing that we wanted to do to give back here in Bridgeport was we started something called a Collab Exchange. Yes. Right? So the Collab Exchange, Inc. Uh, started off as a hybrid co-op um, serving Bridgeport residents or Bridgeport entrepreneurs. Yeah. And the thought process at the time was, being a business owner downtown Bridgeport, one of the things that we always talk about where there's nowhere to shop. Yeah. And we've always said the same way you hear the term that, hey, my neighborhood's a food desert. Yeah. Right. There's no grocery store yeah. around. Well, downtown Bridgeport kind of started to become a retail desert. And one of the things we thought was, wow, you know, here's an opportunity for us to bring all these entrepreneurs we're working with who are creating their own clothing line, their own product, yeah. marketing themselves. You know, they have so it's Bridgeport made. It has value it's a product it's a service how can we get them to offer their product and service out of downtown yeah so we created this co-op here called the collab exchange yeah. where they all paid into it and now we started off with 18 entrepreneurs who now ran a retail store downtown where now they're giving had a place to sell their goods and services yeah out to the general public mm -hmm. with the goal of scaling them up so that they can move on to own and operate their own retail store yeah around Bridgeport, specifically downtown. Yeah. And that was how we started the Collab Exchange. That, that, that was 2019, 2018? That was 2018. Okay. That okay. was 2018. Today, in 2022, we relaunched the Collab Exchange as a full-scale entrepreneur resource center. Okay. With a wealth of, of, of services um, available to entrepreneurs, people looking for more professional development, and the opportunity to grow and scale up. Our goal is to take our, our, our entrepreneurs from from from... You know, just entrepreneur to CEO. Yeah. How do we get you to scale up your company so that you can become the next job creator? Yeah. The next person um, 
you know, growing, creating jobs, taking retail space or taking owning property. Yeah. Real estate ownership. How do we take back the block? Yeah. How do we become economically empowered to be in control of what's happening in our community? And we can only do and do that by sharing information, scaling people up, connecting to um, capital and resources. We accomplish all of that through the collab exchange. Did, did the uh, did the pandemic um, kind of hurt the 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 collab exchange as as it was formed in the beginning? It didn't hurt. It caused us to reevaluate. Got it. And I think that happened for a lot of organizations. No, of course, yeah. I mean, everybody, yeah. whether the nonprofit sector, yeah, all businesses. I mean, you saw some businesses literally got purged out, yeah, during, and couldn't make it through the uh, the pandemic. We were nimble enough to be able to pivot and make decisions and change it. I mean, we. We went from being able to be open to the public all the time to maybe just having a, a series of pop-up events. Yeah. Maybe it was just a vendor pop-up. Maybe it was just a, um, we went to Zoom, obviously. Yeah. Started hosting workshops and, and engaging opportunities there. Um, one big thing that we did um, that was pushed by my business partner, she decided, hey, let's, you know, there's a demand for people that want to read or have a quiet space or whatever. So mm. we actually relaunched for a summer the collab exchange as a bookstore okay and we hosted networking events books and coffee yeah and it just kind of changed the look feel the energy of what people are feeling at home during covid during the pandemic yeah and having a different way to collaborate and meet people and connect yeah and so as a bookstore which you know who opens up bookstores these days not that it cannot be done yeah but you got to be strategic you got to create an experience and the Collab Exchange has always been about creating an experience on Main Street in Bridgeport. Yeah. And we carry that theme through so that we're teaching other entrepreneurs how to become a resource through their business to the community. Because if you have a social benefit to what your company does, yeah. the, today we see that that's, um, you know, e even large companies are all about how, how what's our community benefits. What's our community benefit agreement look like? Yeah. And as small business owners, we need to be mindful of that too. Yeah. How we connect with the community that you're also asking to support you yeah. in your business. So we're intentful here at the Colab Exchange to provide a safe place, a safe space for um for all entrepreneurs, but specifically our black and brown entrepreneurs who have typically been left out of conversations. Yeah. We don't get access to the same capital as our counterparts. We're not included. And many tables around business development. We are we're we're the sounding board. We're here to fight and champion our small businesses so that they thrive and they get access to the same tools and resources that uh, entrepreneurs getting access to in Hartford, New Haven, Stanford, or any of the other uh, major cities. Well, what what what, what, could, what could we do as, as a community um, to um, make sure? Because for I think for me, what I've seen as far as resources go. Um, for entrepreneurs, um, what I've seen is that sometimes there, there are resources out there. Folks just don't know about them. And when they find out, it's too late, right? So it's, and people are like, oh, my God, I didn't know that was, that was happening. You know. So what, 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 what could happen or what could we do to make sure that this information is getting to the right ears? Yeah. I mean, in, in the advent of, of, of social media, the biggest thing we could do for our friends and, and, and business is share, right? It doesn't cost anything. Yeah. It's share information. There's no no one hoarding information that's ever that that doesn't help, right? If we talk about being collaborative, the biggest thing is sharing knowledge and information. Uh, the Collab Exchange. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Go to the website. We're consistently having professional development workshops yeah. and other opportunities here that can easily be shared with friends and and, and family and stuff like that. Um, supporting them. Yeah. You know, sometimes we see what, what, you know, we see what someone's doing, or let, I'll use the Collab Exchange again as, a, as an example. You see what we're doing show up. Um, we, we, want, we always talk about that time is valuable. We always talking about, you know what, man, I, I, I need a return on my investment. Yeah. You know, well, there's a return on your involvement too. Yeah. And if you're not getting involved or putting yourself out there, networking more, um, where now you're in position to share these resources with others, then you're almost as guilty as the person who had the information and didn't share it. Didn't share, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, there's a second part to your question too, right? It's not just that we didn't know about it. 
A lot of times, small business owners are overwhelmed with running their business. Their own business. To be their able their to. own business. That they, don't, they lack the knowledge, the technical guidance, the assistance necessary yeah. in order to get access to resources. Or let's say a particular micro loan or, or, or some kind of a loan fund or, or even a grant. They don't know how to write these grants. They yeah. don't know how to go after um, some of these opportunities. And a lot of it is because of the way that they're structurally running their business. Yeah. Their bookkeeping's not in order. Um, they're not doing the things that a business owner needs to do to fully be able to grow, right? So if, if you're a baker making great pies and selling pies is not enough, right? Because that's not, really, I mean, that's just the transactional part of the business. Yeah. But you need to understand the bookkeeping, the marketing, the branding, the, the dealing with employees, dealing with personnel, the customer service, the management of all those flows. And at some point, we need to teach our business owners who start up these companies how to elevate themselves. Yeah. You have to elevate yourself and learn not to micromanage. We need to learn how to trust people that we bring into our teams, yeah. how to empower them. And um, you know, those, those skill sets, you know, those soft skills is what is the difference between our small black and brown businesses elevating and excelling versus those that get caught in the, you know, on the treadmill. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what happens is you get entrepreneur burnout. You know, we burn out from doing too much. And then all of a sudden you're not questioning, man, did I, did I take the right journey? Yeah. Was this shit I, I've done? Yeah. And keep in mind, there's nothing wrong with failing in business, right? The, the, it's okay to fill in business because you take those lessons to help you with the next venture you yeah. want to go into. Yeah. And not all businesses are profitable. Some businesses, you might just hit that wall and, un and come to the understanding that, you know, I've, I've accomplished what I could with this business. The most difficult part for us to do is let, let go. go. Yeah. It, it's like, oh, it's like burping a baby and you got to realize, man, this, uh, this, this, this wasn't the one. Yeah. But, you know, what I'm doing today, I've, 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 I've owned and operated many, many businesses. Yeah, and uh, over over my, my my journey to get me to the point where today I'm an economic development consultant, helping investors, small business owners, and and uh, nonprofit entities understand how they can help in better communities through economic development activity. Yeah. So, and and I'm glad you went there as far as saying that um that you've been involved in many uh, businesses, right? Because I, I think I know, and, and a lot of folks know that you have been involved in businesses, some, you know, in the front and some kind of like behind closed doors, right? And so, and so I, I think my next question for you is, um, what, what, is, what is something that, that attracts you to a specific business? Because from what I know, without going into specifics, you've, you've been involved in different types of businesses, right? Um, that some don't really match the other, right? And, and, so, and so I wonder what, what attracts you to a business? Mm -hmm. So good question. Uh, you know, the attraction to a business is impact. Okay. Right. So the number one thing you should be doing a business is is understanding what need, what solution you're providing, what need, what gap are you closing? Because yeah. I mean, if you're gonna tell me you're in a t-shirt business, which by the way, you're filling this t-shirt out amazingly, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can buy a t-shirt anywhere. Yeah. Right. So yeah. It, 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 is it so cool? Is your t-shirt that cool? Maybe it's the brand or the logo that you're creating or, or an image, or maybe it's tied to a story, but we have to learn how to connect our stories with the products or business that we're, that we're, um, you know, behind. Yeah. So yeah, the types of businesses I, I've been around, whether it was a computer store or the restaurant, I own Mo's Burger Joint, uh, downtown Bridgeport for 10 years. Yeah. Whether it, it's always about a few things, right? I get the opportunity to create jobs. I get to hire people and make an impact and difference in their lives. So regardless how small of a job you think it is, those jobs are meaningful to them. Yeah. And, and a lot of times it kickstarts someone. It, it gives that re-entry person an opportunity to get back on the payroll books for, you know, that they can be considered for a future job. Yeah. And, and someone has to give them that opportunity. So being, putting myself in a position where I can do this in a community yeah. and still provide good service, whether it's food or an entertainment experience, or when I had a computer store, I'm providing technology. I'm custom yeah. building computers yeah. for people in the neighborhood. Do you know the pride I used to say, man, you know, people, oh, I still have my PC Flex computer. Yeah. They weren't saying they had a Dell, yeah. they had an HP or a Compact, which was like, they had one of my computers. Yeah. Um, that was huge. 
You know, so being able to know that you're a connector in and played a role in their lives in some way, shape, or form yeah. through business, where they're not identifying, oh man, that's the business owner of so and so, and they remember and relate to what you did for them. Yeah. So that, so it's not necessarily so much the type of business, because you said it's a variety of businesses that have been around. Yeah. yeah. It's the type of audience that I know I can impact Got through it. that business. Got it. And one thing we know, right, we all need different things, right? Yeah. You, there's somewhere you shop for your shoes. There's someone you choose for car insurance. There's some, So there's a business for everyone. Yeah. Um, and we all choose services, right? We yeah. all have different cell phone providers. We choose different insurance providers. We, we, we choose, uh, you know, you, you have a Russell Athletic shirt. I like Russell, you like Russell, I like Under Armour, whatever. Yeah. There's, there's a reason why different brands and different things, um, because they relate to different people. Yeah. So it's how do you connect to that? So I love creating something that connects with people. And a lot of times, a lot of the businesses that I'm involved with are businesses that I was involved. I'll use the burger joint for an example. That I was hired to develop that concept for a client. Okay. All right. I didn't open the burger joint. But after three years in Bridgeport, they wanted to exit the market. And I was like, man, I can't let this business fail. Yeah. So I made them an offer. I kept it going um, because I knew the ins and outs of that business because I was intimately involved as the business consultant from day one. Yeah. So I kept a business from going out of business in my community. Um, that's the backstory. No yeah. one knows that. Yeah. They just say a business that's open serving food. Yeah. But the backstory is if I didn't come in, it would have just been another failure in our community. Yeah. You know, another business that opened up and closed. Got it. And I didn't want that to be the narrative. Yeah. And is, is, there, is there a category or, or a type of business that that, that you've uh, maybe have thought about getting involved in? Maybe not tomorrow or the year after, but you, you say, you know what, at some point I would love to get involved in this kind of business. Yeah. I, I think, I think I've kind of satisfied my palate. Okay. No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Real estate was kind of the last one. Okay. And uh, and that's really where I've, I where I've made a significant focus over the last six seven years. Is, okay, is getting involved in the real estate development process and working with a lot of real estate developers on how that works and how can we better um, be better stewards of land use. Yeah, you know how we, we have a lot of empty lots, a lot of land. I tell people all the time, look at your community and look at these empty lots, and we want to say, oh my God, they don't clean the streets. It's blighted. You have to make it attractive first. Yeah. And the first person to notice that empty lot is you. Us, we living in a community, the first person yeah. to notice the empty lot. So when someone from out of state comes and buys that lot and wants to put a multifamily building, that's not gentrification. Yeah. All right. That's someone who's a business owner taking advantage of an opportunity of a lot that we stared at for 20 years yeah. and made no moves on it. So... Are they identifying our neighborhood or did we not value that lot? Yeah. So I think the mentality of, of how we go about our daily journeys, you know, if, if your goal is to make an impact in your community in some way, shape or form, invest in it. And at some point you invest your time by volunteering. Yeah. You invest your knowledge by sharing, you know, being a mentor in a community or, or, or talking to our youth and stuff like that, or put up your dollars. Yeah. You no, know? no, definitely. Now, now, be, before before we started, we sat down to the interview. We were talking about a few things, and one of the things that came up was politics, right? And we talked about, um, you know, talked a little bit about politics. And one of the things you said that that caught my attention was that you said, you know, politics is involved in everything, right? Um, and so whether you know it or not, whether you're um, whether you're you're specifically um, in it or not, regardless, whatever you're doing, it has politics within it, right? And so I would love for you to kind of like expand on that a little bit. Yeah. So I'll, great. I'll, I'll so, that. Yeah. So great question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So that's a great question. You know, I always say if you're not into politics, politics is into you. Got it. Right. Politics shapes and forms public policy, and public policy is how we decide what your taxes are going to be. Public policy, and not only what your taxes are going to be, but where that money goes, how is it utilized? Um, politics shapes the way we view and see the city and the growth of the city. And, you know, not just Bridgeport, anywhere. You insert city here. You could be living in Baltimore. If you're watching this in, in Houston, Texas. Politics plays a role in everything that we do. Yeah. Um, because what is the role of politics in itself, right? In itself, 
the role of politics is to push public service, right? When you look at your local government and you vote for your local mayor, that mayor is the CEO of the largest budget in the city. And managing that budget and figuring out where you want to make investments, capital improvements, um, public safety, um, you know, social services, all the different things that we want to have a good quality of life is determined by politics. Yeah. When you say, man, I want to move to uh, town of Trumbull, for example, I want to move to Trumbull because they have a good school system. Well, how do they get a good school system, right? It's a culmination of yeah. good investments that were tied to politics that created this environment that created a stable educational system. So politics plays a role in everything that we do. Um, so if you're not really into politics, you're doing yourself a disservice because all of us have the right to vote. And your vote is kind of like the, one of the last points of power that we have. So I always tell people, if you're not really into politics, that's fine, but get civically involved. Get involved in, in community organizations of people that, um, or just neighborhood work, and you'll see that the local politician, whether it's an alderman or a councilman or your local state representative or your local state senator, um, they show up because they understand that they, their job is to serve the public. We elected them to those offices yeah. to do specific things on your behalf. So whether you, whether you like it or not, taxes are going to fine you. We pay federal taxes, we pay local taxes, we pay property taxes for business owners, we pay business property taxes. If I buy this printer to be in my business, I gotta pay taxes on that. Yeah. Even though I paid sales tax at the store when I bought it uh, at Staples. So knowing why these taxes exist and where they go and being able to challenge that authority, being able to challenge that culture of what we call public policy, right? Because public policy shapes the culture or what we call the political climate. Yeah. But this, again, these are conversations that we never had at our dinner table. Yeah. We didn't know. We were so busy living or making do or trying to come up out of poverty that we were not involved in the political process. And for those of us who have been um, privileged enough to have the opportunity to, to, to see some level of success in our career path, I still say we should all get involved in politics in some way, shape, or form. I'm not saying you need to run for office, but volunteer on a campaign, knock on a door, get an understanding of what people are feeling yeah. um, in the community. Uh, you know, Find out why they don't want to. Uh, that's a fascinating conversation in itself, yeah. why people don't want to get involved in politics. I, th I, think, I think a lot of it just has to do with, with kind of like a combination of, of, of things, right? And it starts with just not knowing, right? Because you don't know, you don't even know who to ask, right? And so because you don't know who to ask, you it, it, the conversation never happens, right? And so from there on, you just don't know. And you just don't know. It yeah. grows into not knowing even more, right? So the ignorance of not knowing, and then no one is delivering that information to you, literally. Although you can go online and, and, and get it yourself, nobody right. is bringing it to right. you. And so because you don't know, you, you just always lean back on the, I, I didn't know, or I don't know, or I have no idea. You know what I mean? So I, I think a lot of it comes from there. What, what, what do you think we can do to kind of get off of the, I just don't know? Yeah, so I think a lot of it, it, comes, it always comes back to trust. Okay. When we talk about people getting involved in anything, it comes up about trust, right? If, you want to, if, you, if me and you want to be business partners, we need to establish a trust yeah. that, that we have a common interest and, and that we're, we're going to work well together. Um, misinformation is the worst thing that can happen to a community. So it, it's like, um, remember when we were kids, you whisper in somebody's ear, yeah. and by the time it gets to yeah. the end, it's a totally different message. Yeah. That's the problem we have in our community, that we don't trust the information that we're getting because it, a lot of it is misinformed. It's, it, it, it's she said, he said. You, so learning where the direct sources of information is important and being able to be just be a critical thinker. Sometimes you hear something, if it sounds absurd, it probably is. It probably is, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is is how fast technology has the velocity of information. We're all on social media. Yeah. If something happens in Bridgeport, Connecticut, that's um, negative, right? Uh, we have news outlets that's going to Quick. show it to <laughs> right away, so yeah. we know. 
Um, when we see posts on your timeline, whether it's on your Instagram, even now your 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 LinkedIn, your your Facebook, your your TikTok, your Twitter, a lot of the posts are politically inclined. Yeah, you know, or they, or you're giving information. Pretty much, you know, one out of three memes are politically tied. Yeah, when we look at memes and they have a saying or whatever, or sometimes they quote someone and it's, they show you a picture of someone, not even their quote. Yeah, right. But anyone can spin a narrative. Um, so those type of things change the way people think yeah. or impact, influence the way people think. But it all comes down to trust. If you don't trust the source, you know, yeah, ah, all politics are the same. Yeah, how many times have you heard that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I can't trust it. Oh, they're all, they're all. So at some point you have to plant your flag and say, I have a responsibility to know more because I should inform my kids my children, the yeah. next generation, and the politics, they're working on something. So we can either be here and there's politicians talking back here behind the scene or they're over there in front of the scene, but best believe the decisions being made without us yeah. um, that impact us. So I'm always big a proponent that we should try to find ways to get a little bit more politically engaged yeah. and civically engaged, so at least know what's going on. So that you can be better informed and and see how it impacts you, and if there's anything you can do to uh, to to uh, you know do about it, or support someone, or trust in someone yeah. who's in the trenches fighting yeah. on your behalf. Yeah, no, definitely. And and there's also great organizations too that you can find um, that you can trust. And I, I think for me that's that's very important um, because there are good organizations out there who who will give you you know the the information the way they should. And so I think trusting them and knowing who they are, first of all, and trusting them, I think is super important yeah. um, because you can always kind of filter out the stuff and kind of go there and know what it is. Um, before we wrap up, what's what's um, what's in the future for for Calvin, man? You're, you're a young man. So in the in the future for me, uh, you know, so I always ask the political question uh, for those. Um, if, if you're new to me, I, I ran for state representative two years ago. OK, so I'm always being asked. Uh, when are you running for something? Yeah. When are you running again? Will you run for mayor? Um, so I'm typically asked a lot of questions about uh, about will I run again in a political scene? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm really uh, have doubled down on my consulting business. Okay. And being able to expand the impact of projects and the size of projects that I'm working on, um, because I feel like I over the years I've been able to influence a lot of money. And a lot of, pro I've worked on development projects that have made a significant impact, but did not make the necessary impact that was transformative yeah. for people that look like me or come from where I come from. So now um, I, I'm being a lot more intentful in my consulting business to align myself with people that I trust, that have the capacity to do major real estate development projects, create jobs, yeah. bring businesses, and have that kind of an economic impact on not just a city like Bridgeport, but I do consulting work all around the state, yeah. that we're making a significant impact and improving the quality of life for people. Yeah. And that's where, me personally, that's where I see um, a lot of my work and energy and effort going into. Yeah. And you know, in 2023, we're relaunching, you know, the Collab Exchange is exploding all over again, yeah. back to our original vision of 2018 of, of being the true entrepreneur hub for the city of Bridgeport and greater Bridgeport. Yeah. Where Stratford, Trumbull, Shelton, uh, East and Fairfield, they feed off the energy that we're creating here in Bridgeport. And the Collab Exchange is at the center of that entrepreneur ecosystem where we bring all of the talent, the resources, and the people that are real, the real engines of what's happening in the underground scene of business development. And we're able to give those people a voice um to get access yeah. and, and credibility in what they're doing okay all right, all right. Sounds, sounds sounds good sounds good sounds all right nice but my last question um you clearly have a, a love a passion for the city right um it shows in, in in how you speak it shows in what you do and what you have done and some of the things that you said today in, in this interview um and so i i think i, I want to i want to the last question to be you know why like what, what what is it about bridgeport i mean sure you were born and raised here right mm -hmm. but what is it about the city that that brings out so much out of you yeah so i think in all in all major cities right you have um it it, it is about people yeah. it is about the diversity it's about the culture 
Um, growing up in Bridgeport, we had we, we have a different way. There's just something about the water here, <laughs> of the way that yeah. we interact. Um, you know, we're, we're, people from Bridgeport are consistently be asked, "Are you from New York?" Yeah. No, nah, we're from Bridgeport. <laughs> and, and yeah. To the point where I'm starting to think, uh, 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 have, have New York has been envying Bridgeport all these years? <laughs> so I think uh, so. I love this city for for its diversity, its culture, the talent, and the people that have come through here, and um, and how it all melts together. Yo, know, I've traveled around uh, many states and other places. I've lived in other areas. There's just something holistically unique about the way the people of Bridgeport come together, the yeah. resiliency, despite all of the obstacles that we have around us, we thrive in spite of, not because of. Yeah. So it's just like this weird dynamic that if the if if the if other things were able to just part like the Red Sea and get out of our way yeah. and let the people take over, you can't like Bridgeport is one of the biggest best cities to be at. Because there's opportunity here, um, proximity to everywhere you want to be. If, if you want to be in New York City, you can be in New York City. You want to go to Boston, you want to go to Providence. But we're at the middle. We're the central core yeah. of the fabric of what is cool in the state of Connecticut. And we have not found a way to amplify it. Yeah. But we set the trend and we're where we're, we're, we're that's at. Love it. I, I, I absolutely love it. Um, now, where, where can people find you? Where can people find... Uh... Yeah, so absolutely. So uh, find me on LinkedIn, Kelvin Ayala, K-E-L-V-I-N, Ayala, A-Y-A-L-A. -A um, you can shoot me an email at kelvin.ayala at ledbyusct.com. Yes. Uh, for the consulting business, anyone that wants to talk to me about some consulting opportunities, www.ledbyusct.com. The Collab Exchange is equally available Right online, we're located downtown Bridgeport at 1123 Main Street, um, right downtown in the center of it all, www.collab-exchange.com. Yes. Uh, find us on Instagram, find us on Facebook, simply Google Collab Exchange, Google Led by Us, uh, Google Kelvin and Yala, yeah. and uh, I promise I'm not hard to find. So No, most uh, definitely. Guys, looking forward to connecting with yes, people, yes. Li people out there, for people listening outside of the state, in state. Uh, if you listen to this podcast six months later from now, find me. Let me know. Let me know that you found me on Transcendent Outlook. I yes. want to thank this man for creating such a terrific platform for people to connect, uh, get to know one another, and really bring bringing dynamic people to the forefront and creating yeah. a stage and what, platform. What, 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 what we'll do is, um, if, if you're watching on YouTube right now, all of the information that he just talked about will be in the description of, of this video. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, Google, um, Stitch, wherever you're listening, um, it'll be in the, in the description as well. So, um, You'll be able to find them if you have to find them. If not, just contact me directly and I'll, I'll point you to the direction of where you can find them. Um, Calvin, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. It's been a long time coming. We've talked yeah. about this interview for like four years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of culminated. It's taken, but but I'm happy. You know, timing is everything. Of course, and, and, of course. And, and uh, the best content comes when, when at the right time. Yeah. And I think we got to and I'm, I'm glad we were able to do it here at the Collab Exchange as opposed to anywhere else. So it, it, just, it, 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 it kind of gives it that feel. And for me, that, that's what it's all about, having a good feel, a good vibe. But thank you so much, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. And thank we'll you for having me. Yes. Continue success in your journey. Transcendent Outlook. Eddie Transcendent. Motivational speaker. Um, take a look at his bio and check him out. He's a super impressive guy himself. Thank you so much, brother.